later. We will not be able to probably get to a lot of questions, but we will try. And if we need to do some follow-up on a Q&A, we will. So um, what I just know, here's the premise, that in order for us to be ready to open our schools and our district offices, we really need to make sure that we take every step we can to make sure that our adults feel safe, cared for, and, and ready to go. So what we're gonna do here is give you an overview of, of the steps we've taken. This doesn't mean that these are the steps you need to take, but we have essentially learned from our mistakes, so we're gonna share them with you to provide you um, a strategy that you might wanna consider. That's number one. Number two, we worked with public health every step of the way. So what you hear from our team today will definitely be something that you could um, absolutely uh, replicate if you chose to. Um, we listened really carefully to our teams and our staff. Right, so just know that there were multiple uh, focus groups that were held so that we could listen to what our staff said about what areas that they would be concerned about upon their return. We then modified our environment and you'll be able to see some pictures that show you about show you how we did that. Um, and then we continue to listen to our staff, right? So here we go, we're gonna move right now, Patrick McLaughlin, who is on the Return to School Task Force, which we've identified is gonna be the person that gives you some backup information. And Patrick, if you can go ahead and take it from here. Okay, thank you, Mary Jane. I'll wave my hand because you might not see my, my mouth moving with my mask on here. Uh, my name is Patrick McLaughlin and I'm on the the, the return to site-based instruction task force. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here uh, to share the PowerPoint. So uh, this is, uh, as, as Mary Jane mentioned, this is specific to our office protocols and procedures. Uh, we are going to be presenting uh, additional PowerPoints focused on uh, site-based instruction in schools as well at another time. Uh, the, the goal of this is ultimately to share the strategic plans and protocols that we've created for the Marin County Office of Education, uh, our schools and student programs. And our hope is that this can serve as a model for other schools and districts. Uh, just some parameters that we have been working under from the beginning uh, is that this, all of these plans need to be deliberate, they need to occur in phases. Um, these phases need to be consistent with public health um, and CDC protocols and procedures uh, and recommendations. Um, also the idea that COVID-19 is with us for the foreseeable future and we need to begin uh, to reopen certain aspects of our society within the confines of that new reality uh, and that there are proven strategies to accomplish this in a way that lowers the probability of exposure and allows for um, contact tra tra tracing if someone was to become symptomatic. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the implementation that we've take, taken. So this has been a very deliberate process that we have taken in order to get to where we are right now. Um, started by identifying stakeholders and establishing a task force, um, doing research on best practices, uh, that, you know, online resources through the CDC and public health. Um, we also, our, our first step was that we planned and implemented a, a pop-up child care center for essential workers. Uh, and this was based on a model that we used during the 2019 fires. Uh, and so we, uh, at this point, have been running eight weeks of pop-up pop child care um, programs for our essential workers uh, in conjunction with public health recommendations and procedures. Um, from there, we created procedures and protocols, which we'll be, we'll be sharing with you today and that are online. Uh, we presented these documents and trainings to focus groups, received information and feedback uh, that was able to drive our frequently asked question documents. Uh, we have shared those documents with our staff and are starting to share it them with districts and other agencies as well. Um, we also have begun to transition back into the office uh, and we're doing that in phases 
Uh, we're piloting school program in phases as well. Uh, and we continue to secure uh, what is now being referred to as essential protective equipment uh, to ensure that we have all of the supplies that we need um, to uh, have, have people come back to the office and to uh, go to the pilot school programs. Uh, it is important to note that all of these steps have been executed under the guidance of public health um, and that these procedures and protocols are always evolving. Um, as we're getting more questions and getting feedback, um, we are uh, changing these documents and protocols to meet uh, specific needs. So this is, this is an evolving process that is ongoing. So quickly just about how we've been phasing in um, our steps. So we have phased in uh, at the MCOE central office, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we're inviting different departments in uh, slowly over a, a series of about three weeks. Uh, we are also piloting uh, some special education and alternative education programs um, at Marindale, at San Jose Middle School, at Marin Community School, at Lagunitas. Um, and we're preparing for our phase two and phase three. Uh, phase two is really about taking the models that we have, have created during our pilot um, of our special ed and alternative ed education programs and using those to drive uh, and run the ESY programs, our summer programs, uh, with the ultimate goal of um, bringing students back uh, to school in the fall 2020-21 in some capacity. Uh, and we're learning along the way of what that will look like. So I wanna specifically focus on the central office here and things that we have done um, in order to get ourselves set up to, to have uh, departments return to this space. Um, so we have created procedures and protocols uh, to use here at the office. Um, some of them include and I'll, and I'll show you what it looks like as well. Some of them include daily check-in systems, um, specific expectations uh, and protocols around uh, if people are not feeling well and have symptoms, uh, the, the expectation that we'll always be practicing physical distancing when we're here in the office. Uh, one thing to note is, and, and this, this really comes down to that each, each site, each office layout is going to be a little bit different. But one of the things that we've been able to do here at the main office is that we have created two wings um, and the, the design of this building really lends itself to that. So we have a north wing and we have a south wing and people are allowed to, to move about those wings, but the request is that for, as best as we can, we stay in our wing uh, while we're at work. Um, and so we're asking folks to enter and exit uh, the building closest to their workstation and within their wing. We are expecting all to wear face coverings when they're in the building and in shared spaces, uh, obviously practicing a regular hand washing uh, when they enter the building and throughout the day. Um, we've created health and safety stations that have the essential protective equipment, and I'll show you examples of what that looks like, and also an expectation that folks take responsibility for their workstations uh, and keeping them clutter-free and do some sanitizing of those spaces at the end of the day. So um, we have put signs throughout the, throughout the office um, asking folks to wear face coverings, um, we've also put QR codes uh, by all of the entrances and exits. And these QR codes, we ask that people use their, their phones to use the QR code to do a check-in and a check-out at the end of the day. And there are a series of questions that are asked when they um, are using the QR code. So uh, email address, first name, last name, but uh, also a health check-in question on if they've had any symptoms over the last 24 hours. There's a check-in time and a check-out time as well, and that's really to help us monitor who is in and who is out of the building at certain times during the day and certain days. And this will really help 
if someone was to become symptomatic, um, this would help public health to do uh, contact tracing um, to know who was in the building and who might have had exposure to that person. Um, we have turned all of our multi-stalled bathrooms into single use, and so we have a sy system to determine if it's occupied or vacated. Um, we have created health and safety stations throughout the office, which include face coverings and gloves and disinfectants and sanitizers and hand sanitizers as well. Um, in, in line with the, the north and south wing model, we, do, we did create a north wing break room uh, just to, to help encourage that separation the best that we can. Uh, we've also created spaces outside uh, for breaks and put down tape and signs to help encourage uh, folks to keep the proper physical distance. Uh, within our meeting rooms, we've created maximum capacity uh, signs as well as taped off sections within those spaces to, to help encourage that physical distancing as well. Uh, one thing to note is that we are not planning on hosting any public meetings at this time. Um, so it is closed to the public. Uh, the central office is closed to the public at this time until uh, we're given notice from public health that it is appropriate for us to, to change that. Uh, we have created a mail system uh, within the central office to help limit the amount of hands that are touching mail. We have one person specifically designated to um, have all incoming and outgoing mail sorted and, and brought to the various work areas and departments. Uh, and again, we have encouraged folks to clean off all clutter from their desks. We provided them boxes to do that. Um, and then I've also provided them with the, crop, the proper EPE, which is the essential protective equipment to sanitize their desk at the end of the day. Um, all communal, um, equipment is uh, separated the, to, to keep that social or that physical distance between them, uh, as well as the EPE to wipe down those, those, um, those communal equipment, that communal equipment at the end of use. Um, in addition to that, we have provided uh, a number of resources on our website, um, and I would encourage you to access this as well. Um, and some things to say about it. So on our website, under the former NCOE staff a tab, there is a link called COVID-19 Office and School Protocols. And I'm just gonna share, uh, show you what that looks like, if this works for me. And so if you go to the former NCOE staff, there's a COVID-19 Office and School Protocols and if you click that and scroll down, um, we have information about what we're talking about today. So we have our office pro procedures and protocols, which is a, a very um, thorough document about our procedures and protocols, frequently asked questions. There's a video on safety precautions of coming into the office. There's information about the daily check-in and check-out survey. And then the presentation is also um, located on the website there for you. And lastly, um, we have additional resources that we have been providing to our staff, which include regular check-ins on Microsoft Teams, uh, as well as we have a phone number and an email specifically uh, for any questions, concerns, or comments that come up from the team um, at any time. And one thing that I will um, emphasize is that it is very, very important, um, and we have gained so much from listening from, to the questions and the concerns that are coming up um, because everyone has a different perspective and has different needs, and it's been really, really helpful for, for us to design these protocols as we move along. And with that, I will open it up to questions. And let me, let me do this, actually. I am going to unshare. While, while um, we're getting questions, I just want to note that the link to the information you just shared was just put into our chat. And um, will also be available to you in follow-up 
information that we send out. Okay, what questions do we have? Uh, so here's Mary a Jane, this is Ross Millerick. Good morning. Hi, hi, Ross. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Hi. This is a discussion about office practices and procedures. Will one of the follow-on discussions talk about classroom and daycare centers? Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. But, but just to note that the protocols are very similar, right, in terms of the kinds of things that you need to take into account. But when we go into the small cohort and classrooms, we'll be able to... Um, uh, provide more information there for sure. Thanks. So we do have a few questions that have come in on the chat. Is there a way to get the QR code um, so that it can be used in our districts and schools? The answer is yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure out how to do that. We actually copied it from uh, Office of Emergency Services. So we have, a, as you guys know, we have a team member that goes to those you know, that, that actually supports us through the OES, and that is the intake they use. So we copied it from them. So there's gotta be a way for us to get you a template where you can just put your staff on it. And another question, can we require that staff and teachers get a COVID test? Um, let me just say this about that. First of all, just as a reminder, there is now a free testing available for all of us that are considered these essential workers from school. So that's number one. So anybody can go get a test. Uh, the challenge uh, that we would hear from public health is that the information is only um, information on that day at that time. In other words, if somebody gets a test and it's negative, it doesn't provide you information for the next day or the next day. And so that's always the ultimate, you know, the ultimate challenge. Uh, the way we're approaching it here is everybody knows that they can get a test if they want to get a test. We are not um, in a situation that we're saying you must have a test. However, if in the future public health said um, we want, right, you, I think everyone's aware that one of the biggest challenges, not just in our county, but across the country, has been the amount of testing, and they want more people to get tested so they can get more information about COVID and how it's working in the community, particularly with asymptomatic. So there's a lot more happening in our county. I think we're almost to 10,000 people that have been tested uh, at this point. So if there was um, a requirement, a request from public health that we do more in this um, area, we would definitely do it. But at this point, we're not doing anything to require it. Next question, are there designated people allowed to use copiers or uh, can everyone use it and clean it when they're finished? The, the answer there is yes, everyone is able to use that and any other mul multiple uh, touch equipment. And you'll see in the protocols, we actually do have steps that we are uh, requiring everyone to take. It would be utilizing that, which includes cleaning it when they're finished and cleaning it actually before they use it. So um, those protocols are listed in the materials, but yes, everyone has access. The next question, maybe Mike, you can address this, is how do we determine capacity for break rooms or other shared spaces? Yeah, so um, what we've been doing is literally walking into each room with a tape measure and tape and determining uh, where people can sit. We remove all the extra chairs that will have no use, but we just basically have been going room by room with tape measure and tape to defer, determine capacity. Okay, um, question about the links, which now are posted. Um, how is transportation being arranged to provide for social distancing? So transportation is a huge issue not yet resolved. Uh, there's a committee um, in our county that's representing all of transportation, whether it's um, through the transportation authority of the Marin or the smart train or et cetera, et cetera, or schools. So there's conversations happening. This will be one of the bigger challenges that we will face in that for some of our students, 
that attend public or private independent parochial schools. They may be being transported on large buses, as you know, some of them up to 80 students. And if, um, and we do expect that there will be a number cohort that's permitted that that cohort will likely ex extend to transportation. So this is gonna be an issue that will evolve in the next period of time. And then to add to that, in some environments, there's agreements that have been made with the city or county about the number of cars that can actually go to a school. Um, so if you didn't have the bus, they would, we would need to make sure that those rules were lifted. So we're continuing to um, try to figure out what that's gonna look like. If there is the concept of a stable cohort, then we will be looking at other alternatives for transportation, um, which will include probably different start times, et cetera, to try to figure out how we're gonna approach that. But that is something that is not yet resolved, but there's a lot of smart people working on it. But in the end, public health will make the decision. Next question, since this topic is about safety, is the county encouraging districts to bargain the issue when requested by local unions? Um, the answer is, Yes, I mean, bottom line is that each of our school districts, the, there's a thousand of them in the state, um, have different relationships and the way they handle uh, issues like this could be different, right? Some more formal, some less formal, um, but uh, the expectation I think for all of us will be that we will make sure that we do everything we can to keep all the adults safe, regardless of their whether they're represented or not represented, um, and that ultimately we will be able to ensure that we have the essential protective equipment that's necessary. I don't know if you guys are noting the nuance here that we've been using routinely PPE protective. Uh, I'm going to forget what it stands for, but anyway, PPE. Um, is essentially what's being now set aside for the medical field. Um, the terminology that's being used for workers like we are is the EPE, essential protective equipment. That could be the discrimination between an N95 mask, let's say, and a facial covering you know, down the road. But I think that um, it's really important, no matter what anybody's doing, that they are in such close contact with their employees um, to be able to understand what the concerns are, uh, have conversation about it to develop what the strategies are. Just for you to know, when we essentially presented our plan to public health, um, he you know, essentially looked at it and said, well, wait a second, you have to put tape all over your office. Aren't you working with adults, right? And the answer to that is, that what we're trying to do is do everything we can so that we um, ensure that we're following all the, you know, all the protocols. So this could look different in, in other, you know, in other, um, in other settings. But for us, we felt it was really important to take these steps. However, we had also recommending, we had also recommended assigning bathrooms and he thought, no, that's not necessary. And so did our employees, by the way. So anyway, we're just trying to do whatever we can um, to make sure that people know that we care very much about their safety. Um, two questions related to EPE. Are we having issues getting supplies for the stations that we set up? And mm -hmm. where are we finding and buying EPE? Mm -hmm. um, should I take that, Mike? The answer is things seems to have lightened up a bit, just for everybody to know in terms of access. One of the things you'll hear on Thursday is the calculator that's been developed to try to help figure out, you know, given the size of your school or your office, what you would need um, in order to, for example, have three months supply. So we feel like we're going to be in a good spot. The things that are that we're working on though have to do with the thermometers, right? So that's something and that will really vary depending on the school 
um, but for some of our special ed classes for students that are unable to tell us that they're not feeling well, et cetera, we've decided that we will be using the thermometer protocol at the entrance. Uh, but, um, and then this afternoon at 4.30, uh, the return to school team and I will be talking with the head at the OES about um, what we're thinking about to see what they think about being able to support us if we need to uh, get access to um, PPE or EPE that we're having trouble with. So that's part of the overall conversation, you know, that we're, that we're working on right now. Are we doing temperature screen? We're able to, um, is there any reason not to? Um, public health says not necessary is what they're saying uh, in terms of the overall structure. And we, as, a, as part of coming into the office, we are not requiring a temperature check. We are though asking every employee to make sure that they are monitoring their own health, you know, themselves. Uh, we do have thermometers here at the office, so that I would recommend that. But if anything shifts from the public health perspective, we would definitely add that to our list at our um, pilot uh, programs. We are doing uh, temperature checks for both students and adults, at least at this time. Any word on having cohorts larger than 12? Um, there's a lot of conversation about this topic, uh, and in particular, as recently as yesterday, I was on the call with a, a six Bay Area health directors, along with the county superintendents. There's a lot of interest in trying to figure out like what is going to be the, the size of the cohort. Um, and at this point, yes, there is conversation about trying to figure out what's the right size. As you might imagine, different public health officers might think differently. Just a reminder, whatever's determined at the state will become our floor, if you will. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation between and among uh, the public health officers across our state, but also with the state team. So I think we're, there's a bit of time before we're going to actually have more information about that. But listening yesterday, I got a sense that we could very well see a different, a different number, i.e. a higher number, um, but not really sure um, at this point. And, you know, when we ask, like, when are we going to know? We're trying to plan, right? And the answer is... Uh, we need to, you know, we don't know yet. So um, it was an interesting conversation yesterday, but it does seem like that's loosening up a little bit, uh, particularly, I think, um, at the uh, listening at the high school level of the thinking that, wait a second, high school kids, we can count on them to wear their mask and, you know, we can also count on them to um, make sure that they keep their distance. Of course, those of you that run high schools can probably roll your eyes right now and go, yeah, sure, but that would be part of it. And then at the elementary level, I do think they're taking into consideration the thinking about if it's a 12 cohort, then only half the kids approximately would be able to attend at one particular time, which means they would find themselves by definition if their parents work in a different cohort. And is that actually during daycare or whatever, you know, so I think there's, there's, they're definitely thinking about it, just so you know. Um, we have time for one more, Mary Jane. Are there provisions being uh -oh. made for those employees with compromised immune systems or those employees who live with persons with compromised immune yeah. systems to so, work remotely? Yeah, so in the end of the story, every, um, every situation, whether it's a student or an adult, is one of those situations that will need to be handled using uh, the personnel practices of a district. And so um, what would happen, I believe, is that if there is an employee who is unable to work, uh, given the uh, health issue, that there would be the, the steps that you would typically take. Uh, you know, the doctor would provide some information, you know, et cetera, but that will be essentially, you know, part of the personnel side of the story. Okay, guess what? We promise 10 o'clock, 1030. We're here. Thanks for being on the, uh, the Zoom call. Um, within a short period, I think less than 24 hours, this particular um, opportunity will be posted along with the information 
uh, the PowerPoint that you saw along with the other handouts that we have in support of this. Uh, look forward uh, for those of you that found this valuable to join us Thursday uh, where the focus will be specifically on what is necessary related to how do you keep things clean? How is it that we're going to be able to identify what is the essential protective equipment that we need? And I'll just give you a clue about something. Our future will hold that everybody's gonna be cleaning. So this is going to be an environment just like it is here right now. We're responsible for our own spaces, shared spaces. So um, we'll have a, a lot of, quote, disinfecting to do as we move forward. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. See you later. Bye-bye.